Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's truly a pleasure, a privilege to welcome Joel Brunold to our show. Joel, Joel is a mover and shaker behind the scenes of politics. One of those people who really makes a difference by lobbying for important things, in this case, lobbying for Israel and for Middle East peace in general. He's the managing director of the S. Daniel Abraham Center for Middle East Peace. Many of us know Robert Wexler, who we have spoken to in the past. In addition, uh, he is an alum of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's lectured at Harvard, at the National Defense University, at, the, at universities around the United States and Israel. He's actually coming to us right now from Israel, where he's on a bit of a holiday, You'll hear in a moment why I said holiday, not vacation. He's on a bit of a holiday, and I appreciate him giving us some of his own time to really help us understand a little bit about what's going on in Israel, the whole issue of Middle East peace, and some other fun things along the way. So, Joel, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Robert. And thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's just start with the immediate peace, the news of the days, and that is the recent conflict with Gaza. There are some reports that suggest that even though Israel felt it was necessary to go in and uh, to really take action at this time, that it may have set back possibilities of Middle Eastern peace. It may have in some way strengthened the position of Hamas or the other terror organizations in Gaza. What, what's your read on that? I think you have to be able to separate between the structural problem that is Gaza and the acute instances that come from that. You know, the average age in Gaza right now is around 16. So if you have 2 million people and the average age is 16, you, you have a country, uh, a, a piece of territory that is extremely young, is extremely frustrated and doesn't remember in 2005 or six people voting for Hamas. And so they're, what do you do with this? with this situation? What does Israel do? You know, what does Egypt do? Because of course, Israel's not the only actor that's on the, the Gaza border. Um, Hamas, of course, is since 2006 is in charge of Gaza. And uh, Prime Minister Lapid saw that after uh, an arrest of a Palestinian Islamic Jihad commander in the West Bank, that Islamic Jihad in Gaza was threatening the southern communities. They had shut down all life in the southern communities because there was such a worry about potentially an anti-tank strike that could hit a bus full of civilians or a train. And uh, the Israelis took a preemptive strike uh, with this knowledge and decided to try and take out Islamic Jihad and its commandership. And over a period of a few days, there were many different strikes um, Islamic Jihad shot rockets back, and you'll hear I say Islamic Jihad because uh, Israel was successful at not engaging with Hamas and just with Islamic Jihad, and after a few days, uh, this escalation was over. But the reason that some people say it could have made things worse is it doesn't deal with the underlying structural problem of what do you do with Gaza? And what do you do with all of these young people who, who know nothing except for constant war and are really not a, a not responsible for the situation they find themselves in. And when Hamas doesn't respond, and the Palestinians are so frustrated, they wanna see someone standing up for themselves, does it strengthen more extreme elements within? I don't know, these are all the decisions that Israeli policymakers need to struggle with. You know, if you have a ticking bomb of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, you just take it out and deal with the strategic consequences later. You know, Prime Minister Lapid has been clear that he wants to try and open Gaza, have a, a sea terminal so they can have a place that they can exit. I think if we see some more of these opportunities that enable people to leave Gaza and have an opportunity to have a life there, it might deal with some of the more uh, systemic pressure points and maybe start dealing with the systemic issues. But that, I think, is why you're seeing some commentators say, did this help or did this hurt the situation? And in terms of Middle Eastern peace in general, my assumption is that with the current government, even though the elections are soon coming, that people were more encouraged than with some of the other prior governments, in particular with the Netanyahu government. Uh, is that a fair statement to make? Encouraged in what way? Encouraged that there would be progress to some kind of peace, some kind of normalization. Oh, with the Palestinians. I with think that... But what bonded the Bennett Lapid government, and even in this interim, was this concept that all of them were speaking about called shrinking the conflict. I think that many of your viewers might be familiar with the term that came from a philosopher, Michael Goodman. Um, but 
you know, whereas Micha set this public frame, which is really about, can you give Palestinians, we're not going to separate from the Palestinians because we're scared about a two-state solution, and we don't want a one-state solution. Can we do something in the meantime that, you know, is ambiguous in terms of its outcome, but actually lays facts on the ground that enable Palestinians to live with dignity, rights, and some opportunities? I think, you know, whether it's Prime Minister Bennett or Oh, now alternative Prime Minister Bennett, Prime Minister Lapid, uh, Justice Minister Saar, and others, there was a conflict within this framework, but I think because the government was only around for a year, they were still feeling out the edges. And so I think that that was the thing that people felt like, okay, there might not be a political negotiation, but there wasn't this continued need to defeat the PA. I think that that would be the sort of market shift between this current government and previous governments, where there was this real need to defeat the Palestinian Authority diplomatically. I think that most people would tell you that the Palestinian Authority has been defeated diplomatically at this point, and now what do you want to do? Well, that's a result, I assume, of the Abraham Accords, which really side pushed to the side much of the PA, saying, or at least the struggle or the perception that nothing would happen until there was some kind of resolution. I think it changed the dynamics in terms of could you do normalization before you had a peace process, uh, before you completed a peace process or not. I wouldn't say it pushed the PA aside. I think that the PA is still coming to terms with the new regional reality. I think we have seen, you know, we heard and during the president's visit of the role that Morocco played on the Allenby Bridge and others, I think, and during the Negev Forum about the need to help the Palestinians, we heard from many of the different participants from the Abraham Accord countries, the different foreign ministers and others. I think there is an advantage to utilize the new regional dynamics to benefit all the peoples, including the Palestinians. But it requires people who have very set ways of thinking to sort of try and be flexible about how they do it and do it in a way that doesn't humiliate them. I think that what the Abraham Accords offers is an opportunity to advance progress with dignity if everyone buys it. And but I think for the Israelis, not all Israelis, but for some Israelis, the Abraham Accords isn't instead of peace with the Palestinians. It can work as a complement and to shift some dynamics that have been stuck for a very long time. But I think that if we see it as an alternative, not only won't it work, it could really damage the Abraham Accords themselves. Because whether it's the UAE, whether it's the Moroccans, whether it's the Bahrainis, you know, we'll see what happens with the Sudanese um, and others. The region isn't ready to abandon the Palestinians and saying we don't care what happens to them. People want to see progress, but they also recognize it's in their interest and it might even help the process of peace if they also start building relationships with Israel. And what's been really amazing to see, Rabbi Matanki, is it's been a warm peace. This hasn't been a peace like with Jordan or Egypt. There's been a real exchange with the UAE, with the Moroccans. We've seen every minister in this government go to Morocco and meet with them. We've seen delegations of Israelis go to Morocco. We've seen rabbinical delegations. And we saw the King of Morocco welcome the Jewish heritage back to Morocco. So I think there's been this really interesting warm peace that we can see how that can develop the regional picture. So is that really also fall in line with the idea of shrinking the conflict, of trying to provide more opportunities saying that the peace is not something that's going to happen in one fell swoop, but there are going to be pieces to create the peace? I mean, I think it could. I don't think it necessarily is. I think if you could be creative and diplomatic and think about how these different regional pieces could change some stagnant dynamics, it could lead to different interesting outcomes that could, whether it's whether it's shrinking the conflict or increasing Palestinian rights and dignity, whatever terminology you know, you need to fit into the worldview in which you're operating. There are opportunities that are created through regional engagement that we need to explore. I don't know if they'll work. I don't know if they won't work. But what I can tell you is it is a far richer conversation today than three years ago when everyone was looking at the same pieces of the paper, being like, well, how do I push this forward given where the Israeli public opinion's up to, where the Palestinian public opinion's up to? Like, it, it's just like, what do we do? And so this at least changes the dynamic. I don't know where it's going to go. And in some ways, that's kind of threatening to people. But I think it offers an opportunity that if we're clear eyed, we can sort of shift some of the actors around and see if that changes the Rubik's Cube. So shifting a little bit, but I think on the same the same path, there's the amazing legislation that you had a very significant role in with the Nita M. Lowy Middle East Partnership for Peace Act, which allocated a quarter of a billion dollars from the United States to be able to 
to help things to move forward? How, what was your role? How, what did you do? How'd you get it moving? Sure. So um, I was, uh, before I did this job with Congressman Wexler at the center, I was the executive director of an organization called the Alliance for Middle East Peace, which was the umbrella for all the groups doing Jewish, Arab, Israeli, Palestinian work. And our founder, Avi Meyerstein, who's a lovely lawyer who's based out of uh, just outside of DC, had a vision of replicating something called the International Fund for Ireland. It was a very incredible peace building tool that really did significant work in the Irish context, in the Israeli Palestinian con context. And uh, during my tenure at OMEP, we helped write the we helped write the bills and advocate and lobby for them. And we got it all the way to the finish line. The, the bill passed and was signed under law under President Trump. And it's now being implemented by President Biden. And the thesis behind the bill is very simple. We need to answer the question, what are we doing to make sure the next generation doesn't hate each other? Who is the international address? And this bill creates dedicated funding, both on economic development for the Palestinian private sector and on people to people contacts, broadly said, education, schools, sport, uh, work development, economy, um, environment, you name it. And to try and have something that actually looks at that on a day to day outside of the highs and lows of the peace process and creates a policy tool in which to do that. And it's also multilateral so that it's not just the U.S. putting money. They're, they're the first money, which is important for the Israelis. But you can take regional money. You can take European money. You can take money that all the parties in the conflict trust and invest together on these these essential, necessary, if not sufficient programs that can ensure that there is a future generation that doesn't hate each other. Because if we just allow the conflict to continue to go and you look at the statistics of these populations, it gets worse and worse the younger you get. And so I was really proud to work with former Congresswoman Lowy, who was the chairwoman of the uh, Appropriations Committee, who got this piece of legislation passed, along with Jeff Fortenberry from Nebraska, Senator Graham from South Carolina, and Senator Coons, Senator Kane, and Senator Gardner. And it was a real effort and delighted that it's it's now been implemented and is, is currently moving forward. Is there a program that you can give us an example that has already been funded? Sure. Or so um, when President Biden was in the region, he, uh, he announced um, two awards. He announced one award to connect uh, Israeli and Palestinian businesses through the Paris Center for Peace. And he announced a $5 million award to the Appleseeds Academy to help Israeli and Palestinian kids on tech and learn new tech skills and other things. We've also seen awards to Echo Peace, which were the people behind doing the UAE Jordan Israel water agreement that you read about a few months ago. So they're doing a good water neighbors program, helping the next generation of Israelis and Palestinians care for the water resources. And we saw this government for the first time commit to regenerating the Jordan River in the north. And that was out of some advocacy there. And we've uh, we've seen some more grants coming out, uh, building regional economic bridges, and we can expect more over the next five years. And uh, Congress has already guaranteed the money for the next two years in the next budget. So we know that there's going to be at least 150 million being spent uh, on those issues over the next few years. It's very exciting. And really, I'm curious about the simple fact of how is it that a young person from Edgware in London comes to the United States only makes it up to the rank of a spare madrich in Camp Mosheva in Wild Rose, Wisconsin, and ends up not only walking through the halls of Congress, but also being invited to Saudi Arabia. I understand there's a great story of when you were invited there for some talks as well. How does all of that happen? <laughs> So I'll start with the Saudi thing, you know, like all good. I, I live in Chicago. If Robert Ritanke hasn't indicated from a Chicago accent. I live in Lake Buies, <laughs> Lake Aranche Shalom. Um, and it's wonderful. But I, as people from the city often do, I was up in the great restaurant of the Sandwich Club um, on a Friday, having done my shopping at Sarah's tent. And I got a call from the Saudi embassy while I was munching on a firecracker wrap, um, inviting myself and Congressman Wexler to meet with uh, some of the foreign ministry uh, top officials in, in Riyadh a few months before President Biden's visit to have a conversation about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, and a few other things. And so much good diplomacy happens in the Sandwich Club, uh, which is fun. But in terms of my personal journey, um, I was uh, I was always involved in uh, student politics in the UK. I was involved in the National Union of Students. And uh, I won something called the Legacy Heritage Fellowship, where I would meet my Chicago-born wife. Um, and uh, when I moved to America and I went to uh, the Kennedy School for a year, 
I did a class on Congress and lawmaking uh, with Professor David King. I didn't think it would be useful, but it, it turns out if you're not from a place, you can study it a bit more sort of standing back as slightly more anthropologically. And even though Congress is very complicated when you look at how we pass laws and the budgets, it was something that I felt very comfortable in that complexity. And I just had a lot of chutzpah. I didn't have, you know, I wasn't from a particular district. I didn't have a dad or a brother or an uncle who could show me the ropes. Ropes. I just sort of jumped in. I was supported by wonderfully uh, great pro bono professionals from Steptoe and Johnson and Pat and Boggs when I started, teach me the ropes about how lobbying worked. Um, and through Avi and a great board and a wonderful staff at Allmet. And it just turns out if you're persistent. And what I'm really proud about Rabbi Matanki is at a time when our community is so divided, and it really is. The, the MEPA legislation had everyone from J Street to the Conference of Presidents and APAC on the same bill. We had Republicans and Democrats on the same bill. This passed under President Trump as being implemented by President Biden. I think that that was a testimony of the whole community recognizing that even if we can't agree on where to begin and where we should end, we all can agree that we should begin on investing in the next generation. And I, I, it was a, it, you know, Allmet wasn't a Jewish organization. People took a lot of risks on us. And it, it was something that I was really proud of. And I think the whole community can be proud of. So let's go back to um, Saudi Arabia for a moment. Now, sure. when I went to Morocco, uh, or when I went with you recently into uh, areas of the, uh, that the PL, PA controls in, in uh, Israel, we were always wear, we're told to wear baseball hats. My old joke is if you look at a group of uh, people wearing suits and baseball hats walking together, you know they're Jewish going to shul. But uh, we were told to wear baseball hats. It was a perfect cover. When you were in Saudi Arabia, were you baseball headed or was your kippah out there? I, I wore my kippah. The only place I don't wear my kippah is when I'm in Area A in the West Bank, um, mainly for my hosts. It's very hard for your average Palestinian to distinguish who is this kippah wearer. And for many of them, the people they've met with kippahs are people that they're in conflict with. And that just makes it very complicated. But everywhere else, when I'm in, I've traveled to Morocco, I've traveled to Riyadh, uh, I've traveled all over the place. Um, I wear my kippah. Um, in Riyadh, it was fine. I did get a few looks, but it was cool. It was okay. Um, uh, in Morocco, I've walked around Rabat, and it's never been a problem. Uh, I've walked around not with security or anything else. Riyadh was fascinating. It's a country that's going to, uh, Saudi is a country going through a lot of changes, but we were really there to try and see um, if Saudi would be willing to sort of play a role um, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and also to see what was going on in the US-Saudi relationship. Um, Congressman Wexler gave an interview to the top Saudi newspaper afterwards uh, about, you know, what our conversations were like. And I, I really do think that um, there are some interesting opportunities, some of which we saw there was the fruits of that um, during President Biden's visit about enabling Israeli flights to fly over Saudi Arabia as an indication and the exchange of uh, the retraction of the Israeli observer mission around some of the islands in the Dead Sea. So it, it does show that there is an ability of this new sense of what this new sort of region look like under this new aspirations. But is it, first of all, do you think Saudi will ultimately, ultimately is a long time, will in the near future join with the other countries in the Abraham Accords? I think it requires progress on the Palestinian track. I think that King Solomon has been very clear uh, that, you know, whereas the crown prince might be less wedded to the Arab Peace Initiative, maybe. I don't know, like listening, he doesn't mention it as much as his, his father does. Um, I, I think no one in Saudi Arabia is looking to humiliate the Palestinians. I think that's something that's very important that for many in the Perezal community to understand about all the Abraham Accord countries. Whereas there might be, and you'll read in the newspaper, some frustrations with the leadership in the PA or whatever else, or the machinations of who will be a successor or not. When you zoom out of that real small minutia, the reality is just like the majority of American Jews support the state of Israel, the majority of, of Arabs in the Middle East support the Palestinians. Okay, the, it's, it's culturally relevant, it's important. And the, of course, the linchpin to all of that, of course, is what happens on Temple Mount or Haram al-Sharif. Uh, it's a very big motivating factor in the region. It's deeply emotive for many people and there's dignity involved. But there's a general sense that, you know, whereas we might not now mortgage our entire foreign policy when it comes to Israel to do with the Palestinians. We're also not going to abandon them or humiliate them 
or, or do anything else. And I think that that's also true of Saudi Arabia. So I think that if there is significant progress, um, I think I, we could see some some more significant progress with the Saudis. Um, and I think that's true of many countries in the region who are sort of looking and seeing these first few countries that jumped in, what happened, how did their populations react, what did they get out of it, and has it actually advanced the ball forward? I think, you know, this, this current coalition in Israel collapsed, nothing to do with the region, just as you know, the fractious nature of Israeli politics creates a lot of turnover, and for a region that doesn't have that much turnover in leaders, not many other democracies, it's very unusual about how do we deal with when everything's churning. But I think much like in America, how both Democrats and Republicans dedicated themselves to the Abraham Accords, we've seen in Israel, whether you're Merav Michaeli, who worked with the Moroccans on Alambi, or you are um, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who signed the Abraham Accords and everything in between. There is a dedication to this as a process. And I think that that creates a level of stability that regardless of who is in power, there is a need to try and now understand how we can take advantage of this new regional dynamic in Israel. And that will automatically change the dynamic when it comes to Israel and the Palestinians, in my view, in a positive sense. But it's a, a, recently there was an editorial in one of the papers that wrote about the realities that we now have that unlike uh, previous administrations, which felt that we can create one sweeping peace accord that will solve all the problems at once, then we now begin to see that there can be stages to it. But some of the stages people are very much afraid of. Going back to our earlier conversation about Gaza, uh, what some call the three-state solution seems to be the scariest proposal that people have had. I don't know if you're in the same camp as that or not. Three-state being Gaza separate, separated from Yudan Shomron, separated uh, from Israel itself. Uh, all of those step-by-step -step pieces. I, I saw it also when we were together in Israel a few weeks ago when one of the uh, politicians really identified that there is a still a transactional relationship that uh, if Israel is going to do things for the Palestinians, they still need something in return. It's not that we get this. Is that that issue of transactional, transactionalism going to get in the way of future steps? Well, th that's where, you know, a regional dynamic can be quite interesting. Can we give something regionally if we give something locally? So you can actually play into the transactional nature there. But I think Rabbi Matanki, the problem is, is more acute than that. I think the real question now is what does Israel want? You know, I said before that the, the PH, you know, the, P, the Palestinian Authority has never been weaker, okay? They functionally, you know, they, they, it's, it's at a stage where they're weak towards their own population. There's not a lot of money there. You know, their diplomatic campaign seems to have been stalled. Hamas definitely has more structural, you know, has more oomph with the population because they still use violence. There's, there are all of these different elements going on. I think the question that needs to be asked is what does this all want? I think that's why you saw the rise of Micha Goodman in shrinking the conflict because Israelis aren't sure. They know they're very worried about what a two-state solution could look like in terms of if we leave, are we going to get rockets? And they're equally terrified of a one-state solution. And yet at the same time, it's not just their conversation, because you've got millions upon millions of Palestinians who are in limbo. If the occupation, if what's going on in Yehud of Shimon is temporary, that's one thing. If it's not, that's something else. If what's happening in Gaza is temporary, that's one thing. If it's not, it's something else. Um, what does all of that look like? Where? What is the direction in which we are going? I think that that's a very important thing. And I think that this US administration has recognized that Israel doesn't know the answer to that question. Like the Israeli government, this one couldn't give you a distinct answer of what it is that they wanted. Uh, and the Palestinians, the young Palestinians, as you heard on the trip that we were with you on, many of them, are, you know, want rights more than a state. If, if the state's not going to be the thing that will deliver them rights, we want rights in a different way. And what does that look like in a, in a structure? How do we produce that? So I think we have seen from the U.S. administration talking about um, equal measures of, of security and dignity and economy for both, both communities. And that's all great. You know, we saw President Biden, you know, dedicate 100 million to the East Jerusalem Hospital Network when he was here. But what's the what's the policy frame? Where are we going? President Biden is still a believer in a two state solution, but we're not doing negotiations. So what is it that we're doing? I think that the, the challenge for policymakers today 
And I think some of the work that we do at the center is trying to see, well, in the interim, what practical things can move forward that not just improve lives, but also try to narrow the conflict, whether that's through religious peace building, whether that's through narrative work, whether that's through creating precedents um, or finding ways to grow Palestinian autonomy in ways that don't threaten uh, Israeli security. Uh, but also are things that Palestinians actually want rather than just dictated to them. Like these are all different things that we, the, the time to explore these things. And because the construct of an Oslonian two-state solution seems so distant, that is both worrisome for many people, but can also create some creativity of, well, in the interim, rather than just waiting for something, are there things we can do now to stop a disintegrating status quo? And I think that that offers opportunities. I guess my question is, working at the center, at the Eskin Lillie Graham Center for Middle East Peace, it's almost what you're trying to do is if you don't have the clear direction of what is the end goal besides peace, how do you decide what's the initiative that is going to be taken? It's, so what what is it that what is it that Palestinians want, and what is it that won't collapse whatever government that you're in? like or is within the realms of possibility and then if there's even a touch of those venn diagrams what then needs to happen to actualize that i think is probably the best descriptive thing of i can tell you of of what it is that we do you know um if you look at our website progress is possible which is a new website for us that we set up a year and a half ago but we update really goes through the key issues at the heart of the conflict some policy options that we've developed um some of which are still extremely relevant um, looking at the construct of religious peace building, but also for those of you who are rabbis and educators, really goes through the different worldviews that make up people who live in the conflict, because many of the time we know how we think, whether we're religious Zionists or we're secular Zionists or uh, we're Haredi, we know how we think, but how does someone who is um, uh, human rights, social justice orientated. How do they think about this? How does someone think about this who's a Palestinian religious nationalist? And on the site, we go through with videos and we go through trying to identify for people, how do these people think about it? Because for me, Rabbi Matanki, whether it's at the center or when I'm doing education in Chicago or anything else, we have to be able to be comfortable in the complexity of the moment. And to do that, we need to understand all of the people who are in this. It's not a religious conflict, but of course, religion plays a huge part. So if you're ignorant on the religious part, you can't do it. If you don't know who Sheikh Raid Badir is, you're not going to understand what motivates Ra'am, who are the Islamist part of the coalition last time. So Progress as Possible offers a great resource for people to really bone up on things that even if they're experts on every part of Israeli society, it might give them some additional information on parts of of Palestinian society, Arab citizens of Israel, the region that they might not be as fluent on. And one thing we haven't touched on, and we're really running out of time, so we're not going to be able to really look into this, is the whole concept of religious peace building and of Melchior's work, of Sheikh's work, and of course the center's work right in the middle, bringing people together with a principle that there are back channels, I guess is the best way of saying it, of religious leaders who can calm sometimes the tensions, communicate in ways the politicians are not capable of doing it. Was this something that happened? Like, did, did you or Congressman Wexler happen upon this? How did you get into that realm? I think the center and Rabbi Malki have had a relationship for a very long time. And it's a, it's a long and interesting history. And Rabbi Malki has really been a, a wonderful trendsetter and trailblazer in this. But what I'll say is the role of religious peace building is both, as you've said, on the local level, trying to prevent and tamp down intercommunal tensions in a way that sometimes only a religious figure can, because often the people who are the most motivated up to create con conflict with the other are often religiously motivated. But in addition, there's another level on a structural level saying, if we're ever going to reach any peace agreement, it needs to be in a way that doesn't crush someone's religious identity. The concept of peace vociferously destroys who you are, and there are so many religious people there, it's not going to work. So it doesn't mean that rabbis or sheikhs draw the political line, but they need to be engaged to say, what is the religious exegesis, what's the halakhic discourse, or the, or the Islamic just prudence that enables Jews to live here or Muslims to live here? 
or to lease land or to give up land or anything else that needs to be at the table because if it's not secular peace building is a necessary but not sufficient part i think that the center has gone through some learning on this about how we can do that and part of our job is helping to translate to policymakers constantly how can we integrate this into the policy that we're doing well, Joel, our time is up. I want to thank you. I want to thank the Center for providing this forum for you to be able to make a difference in this world. And in addition to it, to also thank the, Robert Wexler as Daniel Abraham for really creating this opportunity. There's so much more we can learn. I encourage people to look at the website. I encourage people to learn more. And I thank you so very much for your time. Have a wonderful stay in Israel. And we look forward to seeing you back at Sandwich Club very soon. Please go. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.